And over in the crucible trench, Phil's getting closer and closer to steel melter brown. Within less than a metre, we've been digging here, and now we've got really intense heat. I mean, look at the way these, these bricks have been really, really red, and look at the colour of the mortar as well. I mean, I think that those bricks are actually part of a, a, a single structure. I mean, I think they are laid bricks. And look, you've got a very clear edge mm -hmm. of all this material coming round here between the burnt material there and this black stuff on there. But the really crucial thing that does really bring it home is not just the colour of these bricks, but look, they're fused together. I mean, that's fantastic. To me, that's, that, that is the hot face of a crucible furnace. The phenomenal amount of burnt brick means Phil is definitely in the first crucible furnace bay. They now need to clear even more of the trench to reveal its full size. Tell you what, Ian, that is looking like a nice section. Perfection. Perfection indeed. And over where we're looking for a water wheel, Rakshar also seems to be getting results. We have a complete jumbled mess of stones that have obviously been reused and put on top. But then we've got this really nice uniformed bit at the bottom there, really nicely dressed stone. What fascinates me is that lower one with the beautiful stonework. I mean, that's your original wheel here. That is the evidence we're looking for, that we do have a wheel here. Yeah. You know, that's crucially important. So finally, we've got the location of our water wheel. But it's nothing to do with the crucible furnace, which means it's evidence of other intense industry at Derwentcote. Phil, where you are, yesterday afternoon, you thought that those might be recesses to put crucibles in. Do you still think that? Oh, it's absolutely undeniable now, Tony. We, we, we have got two of what we think are probably six recesses. We've got a brick wall there, a brick pier, and then a recess. And the flue goes right the way through and comes up through there. Then we've got another brick pier and another recess with a flue coming up right the way through. And then we've got another brick pier and another recess. So the design is confirmed. And where I'm standing really is, 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 is the stoke hole, it's the engine room. So where I've been taking the muck out, they would have been shoveling the fuel in to create the fire. And what's my bloke Joseph Brown doing, the bloke who lives in the cottage down there? He's the crucible man. Yeah. He's standing pretty much where you're standing. And with his cloth cap, just like you, <laughs> he'd have been loading his crucibles into the furnace to make the steels. <laughs> what about this up here? Is this the same period? No, this is slightly later, Tony. This is small-scale forging going on here. And we've got a census return from 1901 that mentions a spade forging, spade making going on on the site. So it looks like that's probably to do with that process. So that's quite nice, isn't it? Here we've got industry at its height, and here we've got the end of the story on this site. Absolutely. And as Jerry's finally finished processing the crucible slag, we can at last find out how skilled Derwin Coates' workforce was at making crucible steel. Cool, that's an incredibly vivid image, Jerry. Well, looking at this image, if you see that this, this sort of the darker areas, and then you've got these very white areas running around the, these edges. Mm -hmm. And this tells me that this is what's called a hypo-eutectoid steel. It means it's a steel with about 1% carbon. You couldn't get a better steel. So in my view, they are producing excellent quality, high quality crucible steel. Hyper-eutectic steel. Hyper-eutectoid. Oh, nearly right. <laughs> <laughs>